Okay, so that was a bit of fun. We just had the, um, the sort of a, a conversation with Elliot. And if you haven't seen it yet, you want to have a look. The first few minutes are sort of nothing, just about GGR. But then we go into his background. And I was cracking up. I mean, it's a, an amazing story. You've got to work out who Zoltar is. And in, if you asked Elliot, why did he do the GGR? It's because this crazy uh, future-telling electronic machine, when he pressed the button, it came out and said, do the GGR. It's a very funny story. So anyway, highly recommended that one. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that a lot. And uh, he's in good form, so that's cool. Um, another little funny thing that happened, I got 300 stars today. <laughs> I didn't know what they were, but anyway. Uh, if you ever get any of the, the posts on GGR Facebook, uh, it, you might not see any comments because it says you've got to hit the stars. Now, we didn't put that there. Something that YouTube going, we're trying to work out how to get rid of it. But uh, if you hit get rid of that stars thing, uh, you'll see all the comments come up again uh, and you can follow them. And, uh, you know, thanks for whoever sent 300 stars to, to us. That's really cool. But we, we're not trying to generate that. I don't know where it's popped up from. So straight into the questions here. I had one come by email, which we don't usually accept, but uh, that was top of the list that I dropped in there from uh, Roger Buckle. Hi, one of your updates. Could you please explain why some boats have huge barnacle problems and others have no problems, especially after the last race? where well, surely this problem should have been understood. Yeah, it was, it was pretty obvious. There's been some big reports written about what happened in the barnacles in 2018. Um, I'm not a, a marine biologist, um, but there's a few things that seem to show up very clearly. There's massive inconsistency. Uh, you saw what happened to Jeremy, copper coat, not a good record. Copper coat didn't go well last time, but it's not just copper coat. You don't, you know, I mean, people, copper coat works. If it didn't work, they wouldn't be selling it. Um, and then all the anti-fouling on the boats. Uh, some anti-fouling's fine, some's not. So it's not just any one particular brand of anti-fouling. There's something going on. And my theory, my, just an assumption here on speaking and reading a bit about it, is this, and I've mentioned this many times, there seems to be uh, between the um, Cape Verdes and the equator, there's possibly zones of very high activity of the, the small spores of uh, the um, uh, barnacles. And if you happen to sail through one of those clouds, they're going to lock onto your hull and they're going to grow all the way down the Atlantic because they weren't there before then and uh, then they start to grow after. And, uh, you know, it's just luck of the draw. So, yes, some people didn't pay as much of attention to their processes of um, anti-fouling. It appears that Jean-Luc got it right last time, for instance, but then again, maybe he didn't go through one of the clouds. You just don't know. So uh, it's very hard to come up with any scientific conclusive proof about what's causing it, but it's a big issue. And uh, certainly from my perspective, I've said this before, Jean-Luc's worked. Uh, he had three layers of uh, very hard racing anti-fouling uh, on the hull, and then he put a couple of layers of light ablative anti-fouling that comes off normally. So, uh, and he looked after it greatly before, just before the start. Um, you know, putting sun shields over it and, and all that sort of stuff because the Saab Delone has some silting when they flush through one of the really amazing biodiverse lagoons uh, there. They open up the floodgates and it comes through, but it brings silt with it, so he protected from that. And uh, he didn't have a problem, so, so it's very hard to be too much more specific than that. But if something's working, why not copy it? You know, that's the whole truth for equipment and, and anti-fouling. Uh, and these boats are tough too because they don't go fast. You know, they're quite slow. You know, average speeds of five, six knots, you know, maybe seven. So it, it gives it things a chance to hook on. Jeremy's was the real surprise. And again, I'm not a boffin, uh, but he scraped off as best he could. Didn't get the little calci calcified sort of ring that where it sticks onto the hull off. And just maybe that's just got pores in there again and they can start growing really quickly because these things are like cockroaches, you know. That's what they do. They, they just survive, you know, any chance they get. But, wow, it's a lot of growth. Um, you know, in seven weeks to have them that big was quite, quite something else. Um, okay, so uh, then uh, we've got one here uh, could, from France. Could you tell a bit about the story um, about Nigel Tetley who sailed in 68 race with Victress, a 40-foot uh, uh, Perva Trimaran? Uh, as a good sailor, yeah, it's an amazing story. So there were two trimarans in the race, Donald Crowhurst and uh, uh, Nigel Tetney. Basically the same boats, but they had different cabin tops on it. Uh, Nigel was a Navy commander, you know, sailor and uh, very, very competent. And you all know the Donald Crowhurst story. You know, it was a rushed attempt at the very end and, and uh, uh, he fooled everyone, you know, sailing in circles and so on. But the, the downfall, you know, in fact, Nigel's journey was really an epic because it was the first 
multi-hull to go around the world in, in the Southern Ocean. Uh, he probably shouldn't have survived, but he did. Got through the Southern Ocean. Uh, it was an amazing feat. Uh, you know, quite surprising when you look back on it and the design now compared to back then. And what, what was his downfall was that he was getting the reports that Donald, that Donald Crowhurst was, was actually um, on his tail all the way through. And uh, Victus was up there. I don't know. You know, he, he figured he had to keep going because he didn't want Crowhurst to, to pass him. And so he drove his boat in the last bit just a little bit too hard. And, and in the end, he, he broke up about 1,200 miles from the finish and had to be rescued by a ship. And he got off and it was the end of his GGR. Now, if he had gone around and made that last 1,200 miles, he would have absolutely been the fastest uh, solo circumnavigation, and he would have won the 5,000 pounds and so on, uh, but it wasn't to be, and it was you know, particularly attributed to the fact that, that uh, he was under pressure from keeping away from Donald Crowhurst. So, so it, it really was quite a, a feat of um, amazing seamanship. So, uh, and there's been a lot written about it, but it's an untold story within the GGR for sure. And in fact, we were just discussing, uh, had this discussion even with uh, Sir Robin some time ago, you know, with this, this voyage, uh, the GGR is about Matessia, Bernard Matessia and Joshua, 60th anniversary and so on. And it's a great story in itself. And we're looking at who to focus on next. And Robin was the, immediately of the opinion that it should be Nigel Tetley because it was um, such an epic at the time, you know, uh, quite an interesting one. Uh, okay, um, from Gonzalo, did the GGR have a boot, have a stand in the boot show? And are you planning to expose GGR more to the media? <laughs> If you want that title partner, you need to shake some things. Don't worry, baby. We're shaking everything we got. <laughs> We've had some of the best in the world working on it, and we're still uh, lucking out. We uh, usually do boot, and in fact, we tried to do the last two boots, but we got knocked on the head by, um, by COVID uh, on both occasions. We had grand visions of being there to uh, expose the GGR. As you know, we went to uh, Southampton, and we went to... Uh, uh, in a couple others, but anyway, uh, we're not there now because we're a small team and all very busy, so we can't be there. But Lutz is actually going up there to promote his uh, uh, promote his GGR efforts. He's entered the next GGR, and and uh, he'll be there uh, next weekend, uh, giving some presentations on stage. So if you want to meet Lutz and find out about what he's up to, then uh, get on in and, and have a chat. But uh, but yeah, we won't be in boot this year. It is an amazing show. It's one of the the last great uh, boat shows where you can wander around and, and tie kick and look at all the dream machines and the and the equipment stuff. Good fun. Uh, okay, so what will be the welcome home like for uh, Simon? Any celebrations? Well, first of all, Simon's got to get home, same as the others. But irrespective of that, everyone who crossed the start line in the GGR is a GGR entrant, and they're all invited back for a huge party. Okay, uh, it'll be a big prize giving. You know, I'm not sure what. Yannick and Lassab have got planned, but it'll be a lot of fun, and it's for the public, it's for everyone. It's like a open sort of concert type thing. In fact, uh, uh, last time in 2018, Jean-Luc had his band there, and even I had to say, sing, sing one song, which was a bit of a giggle, but it was a lot of fun, great atmosphere. So that's the big prize giving. That'll be somewhere, uh, somewhere late June, we think, uh, something like that. And then individuals, when they turn up, it's a big hoo-ha, you know, when they get there. The people of Lassab Delone really... Uh, you know, take ownership on the GGR, and so that we're expecting to see a lot of people on the wall again. And and uh, you know, it'll be a big. We sunk the marina last time <laughs> when we were there. Uh, Jean Luc came in; it was all pretty cool. And then Mark Slats came in, and we were on a crossover beam. We had so many people there that it actually sunk and cracked. So they've changed that now. Uh, we're not allowed on these side. It's the gate. They have a, a gate that comes across. Anyway, so yeah, there'll be plenty going on for all the all the entrants that make it back, and all the ones that haven't sailed back. They'll be um, they'll be recognised well and truly when when the prize giving's on. Um, okay, so Darren, have barnacles and hull growth changed in the ocean since 1960s? Was the anti-fouling always uh, in an issue, and how was it addressed before modern coatings? So uh, they may well have changed. You know, everyone knows about climate change, global warming. You know, the, the currents, the temperature of the ocean, acidification of the ocean. There's so many things going on at the moment, and it's getting so critical with potential tipping points and all that sort of stuff. And some species are thriving, some species are, are declining, some you know geo sort of spatial movement of, of species is changing as well. So yes, there's very clearly defined changes going on in the oceans, but I couldn't give you any specific data on barnacles, that's the first thing. Um, was the anti-fouling different then? Yes, it was very deadly. It was uh, TBT, tribillion, the really bad chemical, and, and they found some time ago, you know, 30, 40, 30 years ago uh, or more, 
it was just coming in when I was doing the, the BOC in 1990, um, where they noticed that, uh, you know, oyster farms were starting to cut back that were close to marinas and all this sort of stuff because the, the anti-fouling kills marine growth and all that sort of stuff and it was, was killing all the bio diversity in different things so they banned all that and you can still get it it's still because some applications you have to use it you know on commercial shipping and stuff you can't slip the boats and scrub them down every six months so they're allowed certain exemptions but there's a huge amount of work going on to come up with environmentally sensitive uh, biological coatings for anti-foulings you know all sorts of things some are working better than others so yes it's not as good uh, we i think i've mentioned before we have samples of every uh, we scraped off samples of every entrance uh, uh, anti-fouling to make sure they're complying with the IMO rules. We've got all those samples in the office and if we think any of them had tin uh, or TBT, we can get them analysed and so on. So it's, uh, you know, it's a big thing and, and I, I knew it would be an issue in this race but it's turned out to be a bigger issue than even I thought. Uh, again, affecting the entrance um, performance around the world. So uh, interesting subject but as I say, I'm not a boffin. Uh, but we will do a survey on the whole of the boats on a lot of things in the end of the race. We'll ask all the entrants to answer all these technical questions and we'll put up a big data set and, and uh, it, it may be, I think everyone will find that interesting, not just on anti-fouling, but equipment and, and food and, you know, the things that worked well and things that didn't. Uh, Edward John, Don, perhaps you could mention how few sailors have actually circumnavigated the globe south of the three Great Capes. Uh, my question is how many boats have finished in Chichester class in the previous GGR? Uh, yeah, well, the number varies on circumnavigators, def you know, by definition of what type of circumnavigation it was. If it was um, a solo, non-stop, unassisted, or whether it was stopovers, or you know, the, just solo circumnavigations and so on. I remember when I did mine in uh, 1990, as a just a definition of a solo circumnavigation. I think I was about 110 ever to do a solo circumnavigation uh, of any type, you know, and that was back in 1990. Now that level is probably up to hundreds and hundreds of hundreds, okay? The the clear definition though is solo, non-stop, unassisted, and that's running a, a lot less, you know, I'd, I'd have to have a look. But the records are now kept by the Cape Horners Association. So. Um, so if you get onto the Cape Horners Association, you can see, they've, you know, Barry Pictor was involved and all that, that group, they've, they've logged everything for not only solo, but they're now tabulating all of the people who have circumnavigated around or gone around Cape Horn in fully crewed races and the Whitbreads and all that sort of stuff. So there's a, there's a huge data bank there and they're now slowly taking up the mantle of keeping all those records. So if you want to have a look, head to the uh, Cape Horners and, and you can read all the bits, okay? Um, and of course, there's a lot more around the world races now as well. So the numbers are increasing for solo, solo around the world race, I mean. Um, okay, so from Tyler, how is a code zero, how is code zero abolished secret weapon? If so advantageous, why don't more entrants add a code zero to their sail inventory? Seems like abolished was sailing really well through this last high. Well, the first thing is the secret weapon is not a code zero. The code zero is a, a very lightweight, big, you know, sort of upwind, sail that's not your working sails it's just a massive lightweight one and it's not that it's got nothing to do with that so uh, anyone in the ggr can have a code zero but they can't use the, the traditional snuffers and furlers we don't allow that uh, because they weren't really relevant back in um, back in 1968 uh, but it's not a code zero so keep guessing uh, and it, it, it seems to work although uh, I could tell in this recent one when he wasn't able to run his secret weapon and, and Kirsten actually uh, it made a little bit of distance there, difference there. So, so it's an interesting subject. Okay, Mike Smith, could you please comment on the relative performance of Suhaley and Joshua? Their departure date appears adjusted the same as the GGR in 26. Uh, it, it's adjusted same as uh, GGR now, you know, uh, i.e. September the 4th. The departure from Falmouth and Plymouth, respectively, is approximately 100 nautical miles further from LSO uh, and Joshua's most recent position. So here on the 14th. Well, basically what's happening with those stats on there, uh, Suhaley left, uh, departed on uh, June the 15th, uh, 1968. I think it was June, yeah, June the 15th, 1968. I think that's right. <laughs> so, and uh, then uh, Matessia left on August the 22nd, I think it was. Okay. Uh, so many months later, so June, July, August. So over two and a half months later, okay. And of course, Suhaley's not as fast as Joshua. Joshua's bigger uh, waterline, you know, more powerful. 
Um, and so he was always on the catch-up, and they were about uh, 17 days apart, if I remember rightly, at Cape Horn. So uh, uh, Suhaili had got around Cape Horn, and, and Joshua was many weeks behind. And even uh, Bernard Tessier conceded that he could not determine whether he would beat uh, Robin up to the top. There was too many other influencing factors. And I've actually read that letter that uh, Bernard Tessier sent to Robin to clarify the issue, and it's very clear that uh, Bernard had never said that he was going to beat uh, uh, Robin, didn't know whether he could or he would, and then it turned out to be irrelevant because when he got around, he said, who cares, I'm going to you know, save my soul. Um, so what you're seeing now on the tracker is we've assumed that Suhaili and Joshua have started on September the 4th, the same as we started in La Sable de Long. So you can see the relative performance even though it's different seasons, different time of the year, all that sort of stuff. It's just boat for boat stuff. And uh, it's just a bit of, bit of fun, really, more than anything. Uh, so um, uh, that sort of explains how it works. Um, how are the GGR from, uh, from Sune, how are the GGR participants able to send tweets? Are they using sat phone or something else? And can they then tweet directly as well? Okay, so the way we manage that, we've got two ways they can tweet. One is using their satellite phone, just a simple SMS that comes to us in the office, and then we re retweet that to Twitter. Okay, we control it because, uh, you know, we've got to check that it's the legal tweet and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we also, they are restricted to the number of tweets. They have to do at least one a day, and they uh, can do up to... Uh, one every six hours, but they can never be closer than six hours apart. We don't want to bomb them uh, with lots of tweets, and most just do one a day. Uh, that's using the sat phone. Uh, we, so they can't tweet direct. They don't, they're not allowed to tweet onto Twitter. The, uh, the other one is that we can use the YB3 to do a tweet, and uh, they have to do at least one tweet with their YB3 every week just to make sure they're remembering how to use it because in an emergency... The YB3 is a great aid in the life raft, which you saw from uh, uh, Tapio when he got into the life raft. It's completely bulletproof, military spec, waterproof, you know, goes forever. And it's a tracker, so it's a, you know, even better than an EPIRB. But you've got to have an EPIRB first to get the alert out. But after that, it's a great communication tool in an emergency. Uh, so that's, that's how we do it. Um, okay, so John, I imagine washing bathing with seawater only for the better part of a year does a number of things on your skin. Any idea how they rehydrate without washing, wasting water? Well, you know, it can be said that the worst thing you can do is wash your skin with soap and water because it washes all your natural oils away. And I know this from expeditions, you know. You, you, BO is a funny thing. BO only comes from all sorts of other areas. If you're out in the field or on a yacht for a long period of time and you don't get to wash uh, the main parts of your body, it's it's great. Your skin becomes really healthy, uh, uh, your natural body oils take over and uh, you don't get huge amount of BO, you know. Um, there's certain parts of your body you've got to clean, you know, when you go to the toilet and all that sort of stuff, but that's that's isolated, you know, direct hygiene, not not actually have to have a shower and everything. You know, you just, it's surprising. You don't need to have a shower every day when you're on a boat. Um, you get used to it. And even in crude situations, you know, when we used to be going to Antarctica, you know, there'd be 10 of us on the boat and, and uh, no one's having showers at all. Uh, you don't notice a thing. Um, some of your um, clothing, you know, if you're wearing synthetic clothing, you know, like your thermal underwear and your layers, uh, some of them can create a bit of an odour, but usually they're all pretty good as well. Certainly merino wool, you know, really fine merino wool is, is the best. That is very soft, supple, and doesn't seem to smell. So when I do hot weather, hot weather uh, actions, you know, things I tend to go with the merino. Sometimes in the really cold stuff, I prefer some of the synthetics, but... But now, you know, there's a fibre pile in the ocean, you know, all the little fibres will eventually break down and they're just squillions. It's another big problem. So we try to uh, now, you know, our current sort of uh, theme is to try and stay away from some of that fibre pile stuff and, and uh, stick with natural fibres. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's not too bad. You know, you don't need to have a big wash all the time. Uh, it's good for you. Uh, okay, Simona, uh, when is the best time of the year to round Cape Horn? Uh, Hobart has a deadline for the entrance, but what if they get stuck in light winds between Hobart and Cape Horn? The best time to go around Cape Horn is when the weather's good, and generally the weather's more stable in summer. So it's sort of recognised that anywhere from, from sort of, you know, December, January, February, even as far into March is, is all okay. 
uh, because the the systems are not as intense and so on. There's a funny anomaly to that though that in the in the thick of winter, you can actually get longer periods without big storms. But when they come, they're big and they're serious. Uh, in summer, sometimes you get these fast little ones. If you'd seen Captain Coconut come round last season, he got hammered one after the other, bang, 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 with three or four really intense little storms that, that sort of form up from nowhere, bang, come through and hit you. In winter, they're extreme, really big, but you can usually see them coming if you've got the forecast, and you can still usually manage the, the transit if you had to, you know. And there's been many famous roundings of Cape Horn in in the depths of winter, you know, like, um, you know. So, but generally, it's in summer. Uh, the re, you know, what if they slow down in light wind going to the Cape, going to the Horn? The reason we specifically shut the gate on the 31st of January is that it allows a couple of couple of months to get across, and generally. Uh, that should be enough time for the average passage to get through. But once they get through the gate, uh, it's up to the luck of the gods and the wind and so on. So, uh, so we'll see. But there's no question, touch wood, at the moment it's a very benign season and, and uh, we're hopeful that, that all our remaining entrants will get through without any major dramas. But the stakes increase a bit as it gets later. So, um, so that's the plan there. Oh, I've got a French one. Hang on. Uh, we've got a French question. Sorry, I can't answer it in, in French. From Bernadette, uh, how to get news from Arnold Geist? Normally he's on his way back to the sands after being abandoned, but where is he? Where, uh, when uh, was he able to fix it? Thank you. Well, we've actually been trying to get news on Arnold, and it's not easy. Uh, his team are not sure. The last we saw was that he was supposed to be arriving in the Caribbean right now. We're trying to organise to get an update as soon as he does, get someone in there to talk to him and, and see how he's been because no one's really... Um, no one's really, uh, you know, been updated. He hasn't sent us any messages or any tweets or anything. Uh, we've spoken to his wife, but she's not even sure either and stuff. So um, anyway, the, uh, so as soon as we get some news, we will uh, obviously follow up with Arnold and see what's up to. Uh, for, for the event, uh, he declared himself uh, going to uh, St Helena, and that was his stop. So once he got to St Helena, uh, we signed off with the with the, um, with the GGR, and he then takes over his own processes and so on. Uh, and uh, he's quite happy with that. So he's got a, a uh, in fact, I haven't got onto it. it. I believe he had a, we, we tracked it a little bit on a private tracker, but now we've lost off with that. But anyway, we will follow up with him when he gets there. It's, he's been a long time at sea, and um, he's making progress. We know that, I and mean, he must be just about due to arrive any day. Um, David, hi Don and team. Obviously, after the 35th of January, Guy Waits tracking will no longer be available to view on the GGR app. Will his YB tracker still be active, and will it somehow be possible to follow him uh, and stand alone? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, um, you know that'll that transition will take place uh, soon. He'll start up his uh, own private tracker. Uh, it's a private blog YB. All sailors can do that because it's not just events that are running YB, you can go and buy one, take it on your cruise with you and set up your own, uh, uh, they have a, a system where you can integrate your own tracking blog uh, onto your website or onto your social media and everyone can follow you. So you'll be able to follow Guy uh, as often as he wants to put it up every every four hours again. Um, he can send tweets with the um, uh, with all the systems he's got, exactly the same as he's doing now onto his Facebook page or onto his website and he can make phone calls as well so you can follow everything on Guy's private uh, situation there and we'll, we'll store you know I mean obviously on highlights and situ situations we'll say oh I just heard the guy sail around Cape Horn or something you know and uh, occasionally say good day, but he'll be officially off the event per se but he's still a great we're still great friends we're mates uh, he's a great friend of the GGR he understands the ramification he knew when he was in Cape Town the chances of him getting to the gate were next to impossible Okay, and so it's not something that's just popped up. This has been an issue, and we address it on the fact that he's still a, G a Chichester GGR entrant right now, and and that's with respect to Guy. You know, uh, I know there's a question coming up about. Uh, uh, oh, I'll, I won't get there, but um, but uh, you know that's 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 life, and and uh, he's a very competent sailor, and we we all wish him well, and and we encourage you to follow him on his private ones because it's a great story, whatever the outcome, it's part of what goes on, but we are hooked up in our own notice of race and we have to abide by that. So, um, okay, um, next one. Uh, okay, so John Pinto, what are the rules for disposing of human bio waste? Can it be dumped into the ocean? Are there locations they can and uh, cannot do that? So basically, um, human waste over the side is just completely 100% biodegradable. If you go to the toilet and pump out, it's fine. 
you don't want to do that in enclosed anchorages when people are swimming around. It's not nice, but but yeah, it, it all uh, goes over the side. Uh, we have a requirement that all the entrants have to have submitted a uh, waste management plan, talking about how they, um, what their estimates of their waste is on board, plastic, tins, you know, glass, all that stuff, and how they're going to store it, and then what the approximate weights are. Uh, and then we collect all that at the end and make sure it's all legit because under IMO nothing goes over the side except for food. So they can um, they can put any excess food over the side as well and any uh, paper or cardboard, anything that's, that uh, is, is completely biodegradable and break down, that's okay. So, um, okay, Mike Phillips, Don, could you please explain how two sales on one furl are operated in practice? Thanks. Well, that can get a bit complicated, but it's very simple. You've seen probably the pictures of Kirsten. First of all, you can have, normally you have a triangular sail. Imagine sticking two of them together on the, the luff so they fold out like that. You know, you can fold it out. And so it can be just one luff, and you can put that one luff up your furling gear, okay? Uh, and that's one sail. Or you could have two sails, one here, one there. Pull your swivel down. You can put it in the true two tracks of your furler, and then hoist both the sails on the one swivel all the way up to the top, you've effectively then got the same thing. And so with the two sails, uh, and this is a really favourite rig of mine for, for the Southern Ocean, doesn't matter how you get two sails up there, but you get them up. And the windward one, you just pole out with a pole, all right? so it's boomed out to windward. And the leeward one is just loose. And what that means is you've got total control. So even when the boat's wallowing around the Southern Ocean in the weather, compared to a spinnaker, it's much more... Uh, Easy to handle, it's really strong. You can take a lot of breeze because it'll be like six, seven ounce cloth or something, you know, so you can really bollock downwind with it, you know. And anytime you get in trouble, you just start furling it up and both sails will furl around the, the furler at the same time as it's coming in, okay. Now the, the, the trick and the complication, and we, we went through this and explained it when Kirsten was sailing in. So if you go back to a Hobart Live coming, you'll see how the arrangement of the sheets is set up. They have little tag lines on the sheets and then both the tags can come into one sheet. So then you have have a, a, a port and starboard sheet like a traditional sail and it just means that when you're going to windward or reaching, you've only got one sail but it's actually both of them laid on top of each other. And if you tack, you just tack both of them across the same side. And when you want to go running and open them up, you've got to undo those sheets and then you've got the two individual sheets which are short ones and put your sheets on that and then you've got one sheet on each side so it's a very versatile system and quite effective you know um, on my boats in the past what I've done is had two separate furling gears close up the front like Tapio had and uh, uh, like like Ian Herbert Jones has got so then you don't have the twins but it's effectively the same you've got a number one furling gear on your number one Genoa uh, number one Genoa on one gear right out at the bowsprit and number two Genoa at the stem and even though there's that gap there you're effectively achieving the same thing and I even had mine set up so that when I was healing the the, the windward sail you could with the boom out uh, you could actually furl it up and then when it got all the way in with the boom you slack off on the sheet and you could actually slide it down the forestay into the into the push put and then I had a tag line like a downhaul you just pull it and it just sits there so you don't even have to go forward and you can you got rid of your windward sail then you decide what you want to do there so uh, i did 28 knots with that rig in uh, in a good sea breeze coming around through bass strait in my 50 footer in the boc it's really efficient because you have full main full this full that you know and it's all just handled from the cockpit it's very very cool um okay uh, john edwards uh, uh are you able to track ggr fans by country is the fan base still growing yeah, we get a lot of data on um, a lot of data on Facebook and uh, YouTube. Uh, we track everything. We can see which cities are, are, are strong and so on. Numbers are still growing. You know, we've got seven hundred a month. are still picking up. Uh, we lost a lot of stuff when uh, we lost. You know, we lost some of our big players all in ten days. You know, Tapio went down. We lost Damien Galou. We lost bloody a uh, bunch of them. You know, Pat and all that sort of stuff. And so um, some of our fan base in those countries dropped back a bit but it's still really strong you know we're getting um you know we, we're quite happy with what's going on and uh, it's a great story so yeah we get a lot of data which will all be exposed later on when we do a a, a media analysis and a full uh, survey on everything at the end of the race with meltwater so we did that last time and it was quite revealing 
Um, and there's a huge undercurrent of people. So if you haven't liked or shared and do all that sort of stuff and, and actually follow us, please do, because there's still a lot of people. I, I, I read the comments and see who's actually liked us and who's been invited. There's squillions of people that have been invited but haven't actually liked GGR yet. So we'd love to see the numbers go up. So if you're watching this, make sure you're, you're one of our official fans. Um, okay, Rick Johnson. Um, this was a funny one. He's got a question. I hope the ocean race boats, the ocean race is the old Whitbread Volvo. It's happening now, you know, are really cool. He said, I hope the ocean race boats don't run down the slow GGR boats rounding the horn, um, which is sort of relevant, but it's a squillion to one shot. So as our boats are going through, they've now just turned up in, um, in, the, um, uh, in the Cape Verdes, I think it was, yeah, uh, in the Canaries, in the Canaries. Okay, just a quick sprint, and then they go down to Cape Town. They'll be in Cape Town for a bit, and then they've got a 13,000-mile a leg from there, from Cape Town all the way across the Southern Ocean and zipping around Cape Horn. So our boats will be down there, and uh, they're moving really fast. They're in enclosed cockpits and all that sort of stuff. They've got all the electronic sensors out. Uh, but, yeah, wouldn't it be funny? Uh, anyway, <laughs> but it should be fine, you know, squilling to one. They know where we are if they need us and, and vice versa. So, uh, But an interesting thing to think about. Uh, okay, uh, Vivek, uh, if I'm not wrong, Guy vows to continue his voyage to LSO despite his eminent retirement in Hobart. And Don confirmed uh, of pulling out all kind of assistance for tracking. Yes, that's right. Uh, you know, he comes off the safety thing and, and uh, uh, Guy's an independent sailor then, a voyager, having his own adventure going around the rest of the world, which is, which is fantastic and we wish him well. Um, okay, Viku, another one. Guy Waits and Jeremy Bagsaw's boat had barnacles to uh, enforce them to take their boats off the water for time-consuming cleaning and any failing. Why don't GGR allow periodic inspections of the boat hull at photo gates or fixed points along the way? Uh, I know it's against GGR retro idea of sailing. Bare barnacles forcing any entrance out of the race appears very stringent and rigorous. Absolutely. That's what the GGR is. So first of all, the GGR is a solo, non-stop, unassisted round the world. And it'll always be that. And we don't, we don't, we've got very clear guidelines on what can be done and can't be done. And if you've got a barnacle problem, that's a problem. And it might stop you from making the race. And that's part of what the GGR is. So we wouldn't change the solo non-stop unassisted so they can stop and pull the boats out of the water and check the bottom and clean it and then carry on because it just waters down the effect. The, G, the GGR is a race of attrition. You know, it'll, everyone that sets off is never going to finish the race. You know, that's, that's, that's not what it's about. It, it's the, the peak of the peak, the ultimate challenge, the ultimate mind game. It's, it's, it's ugly. It's grueling. It's, it's horrible in so many ways, but it's got a sense of achievement and purpose and a certain group of sailors are, are desperate to take on that challenge. It's, 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 uh, there's all these cliches about it's the ultimate challenge, you know, it's the Everest of sailing. I guess cut all of that. It's ugly. It, it, it's it's gruelling. It's, it's, there's nothing like it on the face of the earth. You know, eight months isolated, you know, challenged mentally, physically, psychologically, uh, uh, you know, those that can cope. It, it's a pretty big deal. And those that give it a try, it's just as big a deal. So uh, we've got, we've got, it's going to be an interesting fleet in 26, that's all I can say. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it doesn't fit to start scheduling all these things because if you do it right, maybe you shouldn't have barnacle problems. And I'm sure that entrants in the next race will play a lot of attention to this um, and maybe think of creative ways, but who knows. Um, okay, Don. Uh, oh, this one's a good one, yeah. Uh, from Robert Nisbet. Don, you're inconsistent in applying notice of race rules. Uh, you are not prepared to relax the Hobart gate deadline, uh, particularly for the conditions below 405 are relatively calm this year. Yeah, well, we can't because they're calm at the moment, but who says they're not going to be calm in another week or two weeks? So that's, that's a given, and it's, uh, I've explained. It's, a very, it's for respect to potential people who might have to come and assist uh, our own entrance. So that'll never change. Now, on the other hand, you have allowed Guy to sail circa 1,300 nautical miles in the no-go zone without penalty, I seem to remember that you made great play on the no-go zone and treated it as a guy's disregard violated this rule all on his own for, on his, for his own benefit and in my view he should have been disqualified from the GGR days ago. Now that, that's an interesting one there because we, we realised this was an unusual situation that when Guy dipped down I asked him twice to get out you know, for the reasons you well explained and uh, he knows the game and then he just decided not to. He decided to save his own course. Under Chichester, once you're at Chichester, you're still involved with the event. You're sailing around, but 
uh, you have no rankings, you have no prizes, you have no score as such. You're just sailing home, you know. It's bad luck you had to stop, but that's what happened. So we had no way to penalise him anyway, even if we wanted to. And, and you know, we obviously have the uh, the ability to, to delete anyone from the race. But we looked at it and, um, you know, very clearly in the spirit of the GGR, we wouldn't have done that anyway, you know. And, and uh, it wasn't... Uh, to the point where I felt I had to warn Guy again. Two warnings was enough. Um, he at most he went seventy miles be- below the uh, the no go zone, and and that was still sort of not enough to sway us. So it wasn't a case of being inconsistent. We didn't have a process. I only had one option left, and that was to kick him out of the GGR, and and uh, it wasn't that that powerful. You know, we like Guy, we, and he's I've got to say too, he's a very competent sailor. He's got a very good boat. He's been there, you know. He, he's got huge experience. So, so. Uh, but anyway, you might find a slight difference to that in the next notice of race for twenty six, uh, so we can at least manage the um, the Chichester guys. Anyway, I think we're just about done on all that. So uh, thanks, and once again, if you haven't seen seen Elliot's uh, if you haven't seen Elliot's interview, have a look. It's a laugh. It's a bucket of fun. He's quite a guy, and that whole interview had very little to do with the GGR. It was all about Elliot and. And, and how he got there and what he did. So, uh, so thanks for that. We'll uh, see you again later on.